Hi, I'm Dr. Isha Desai, and today on Raise the Line, I'm happy to be joined by Dr. Mark Rosenberg. He served for 16 years as president and CEO of the Task Force for Global Health, one of the largest nonprofits in the U.S. Earlier in his career, he spent 20 years at the CDC, where he helped establish the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, and has remained a leading voice on controlling gun violence. Mark is on the faculty at Morehouse School of Medicine, Emory University School of Medicine, and Rollins School of Public Health. Thanks so much for being with us here today. Mark, do you mind just by starting us out and telling us about your path and how you got into public health? Sure. I think the path is not one of where I planned everything and had a strategic plan for my life, because I don't think you can plan your life. I think your life just happens, and you have to be ready for the opportunities that come. And that much describes my path. It was somewhat circuitous. But I started out with a strong interest in being a doctor and helping people. My mother was a doctor and served people for her whole life. And uh, I went to medical school, and I also went to a school for a degree in public policy, then trained in internal medicine, went to work at CDC. And at CDC, I got the experience of working as part of a team, a larger team, on projects, large-scale projects that were focused on prevention. I worked on infectious diseases at CDC, then went back to Boston and got very interested in using photography to show what it's like to be a patient and to be sick. And it was an amazing experience because I followed six different people over periods of time from weeks to years and uh, I thought I knew what it was like to be a patient because I'd gone to medical school, intern, resident, worked with a general practitioner. But that experience of spending time with them really showed me that I knew what it was like to be a doctor, but I didn't have a clue of what it was like to be a patient. And that really struck me how little I had known. I didn't even know that I didn't know what it was like to be a patient and to be sick. But that experience had a very big impression on me. And uh, I decided I want to spend time as a doctor with people, with patients. And I did a residency in psychiatry. When I finished all of that, um, I was asked by the director of CDC, Bill Fagey, to come back to CDC and start something new, start looking at violence as a public health problem. So I went back to CDC and worked there for about 14 or 15 years, setting up a program to look at violence and injury as a public health problem. I worked there for a total of 20 years at CDC and then went to work at the task force for child survival and worked there for 16 years on large-scale problems, large-scale global health problems. And uh, there it was very much our approach that if you want to do something about these large-scale problems, there's no one organization that can do it on its own, no one person that can do it on his or her own. And you had to do it by working with other organizations. So we learned how to work with other organizations and form effective coalitions to get things done. And I retired from there about four years ago and now work. I'm on the board of the Conrad Hilton Foundation. And we do a lot in basically trying to help poor and the vulnerable around the world. That's been a career path I never would have imagined at the outset, Rishi. There are a lot of interesting curves in that career path that you, you make very smooth in the narrative. But I'm just curious how they felt in the moment. So one uh, point is you mentioned photography. And that doesn't strike me as, a, as something that would have jumped out at me uh, at the time as a logical next step is to look at patients through the lens of a camera. Can you just talk a little bit about that? How did that even come into, into your conscious? Sure. I liked photography from in high school. And then when I went to college, I think I majored in the college newspaper. That's where I probably worked uh, 60 hours a week. And I was the photography editor and the photography chairman did some writing, but mostly pictures. And I love photography. It's a powerful way to tell stories about people. And that's what I like about photography are the stories you can tell. And I think when you combine pictures with some words, 
you can get people both emotionally and intellectually to follow the story that you're trying to tell. So to me, that was really powerful. When I went to medical school, there wasn't much time to work on the photography. But then when I went to CDC, I did have a lot of time to work on photography. And I joined a photography collective with about eight other photographers. And we met every week to review our work and to discuss each other's work. And I decided when I went back, when I finished CDC, and we were going back to Boston, I was supposed to do an infectious disease fellowship in Boston. But I deferred that because I wanted to work on something with photography. And I saw my friends who were technically incredibly good photographers. It was very hard to make money in photography. It's hard to make your way in the arts. But I decided, gee, I knew about medicine. I knew about patients and sickness. Maybe what I could do is use my photography to document that, what it's like to be sick, what it's like to be a patient, how it affects your family, how the doctor-patient relationship develops. And I thought I could show this with photography. So I took time when I went back to Boston and worked on this series of photo documentaries about patients to show what it's like and eventually published this as a book. And I must say, the experience so changed me. I really learned that I didn't know what it's like to be a patient. I didn't know, Rishi, what it's like to be someone else. And it was an amazing experience. And I thought, gee, if I could share this experience with other medical students or with physicians, then they could develop that same understanding and that same humility that they don't know what it's like to be sick. They don't know the patient's side of things and that there's a lot of exciting things to learn. I was very naive. I thought that by sharing these experiences with them, I could change them. It didn't make it any less important to try and achieve that, but it, it takes a lot more work um, to reach people and teach them the clues of empathy or compassion which are so incredibly important to be a good doctor, so incredibly important to work in any health profession, whether it's here or around the world. You know, that point of empathy, I think, is increasingly important, not just even in healthcare, but in all sectors where we're trying to define what makes us uniquely human uh, versus what can be outsourced to a robot or something that can be automated away. And I think developing empathy is so critical to, to remaining uh uh, a value add in society as well as just to other human beings. I'm curious about the disconnect though because uh, even though you and I are talking about empathy, I know there are a lot of folks that are going through medicine right now that say, oh that touchy-feely stuff is not what I'm gonna uh, succeed on. I need to get a great score on my boards, I need to you know just do well in my classes and get an A. Uh, how do you reconcile the two for a young learner that's coming through and feeling like all the assessments and scoring is really objectively based on how they do on an exam, whereas something like empathy is just not valued in that setting. I think a lot of people go into medicine because they want to be of service to people, and they want to help people, and they want to connect people. And if you want to go through medicine without connecting, you're missing, um, I think, the greatest gift that medicine has to offer. And uh, there are ways that you can learn to connect. It is important. It may not be graded in the MCATs or in the boards that you take, but your life is not going to be valued by how you do on those scores. If you want a life that's of value, um, don't miss out on the chance to connect with people, to understand them. And it's not only compassion that you want to develop. Compassion is really understanding what other people are feeling and feeling with them especially the suffering. And it's understanding the view of those who suffer and the people who come to you as a doctor or the people who are suffering. We're all suffering one way or another. You may not see it physically. It may be psychologically. But if you want to understand that, you ought to take the time to understand people and feel with them. What we came to understand, too, is that it's not just compassion that's important. It's not just feeling with someone but it's feeling with them, knowing what they feel, and then doing something about it. 
So it's really consequential compassion that I think is important for a physician or a healthcare worker. It's understanding what the people who are suffering are suffering from and then doing something to alleviate that suffering. Moving this to another uh, area that I know you're very famous for, but of course is your relationship with Dickey and, and that idea of consequential compassion. Do you mind just walking through uh, what happened uh, during your time at the CDC as you were exploring violence and then how you applied empathy and compassion to that relationship? I know you guys have a good relationship. When I went to CDC the second time, it was to start looking at violence as a public health problem. And we looked around and we saw that there's another form of injury. There's unintentional injuries like car crashes or fires, drownings, burns. And then there's intentional injury or violence. So we looked at the unintentional types of injury and we saw that there was one leading cause of injury, death, unintentional injury, death, and that was car crashes. And when we looked at that, we saw that this country had achieved a minor miracle and that they found in 1960s that lots of young people were dying in crashes on the highways. And this country, as a country, said, this is unacceptable. We're going to do something about this. And they started a research program, and they started the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The government said, we're going to spend $200 million a year on research, and we're going to turn around this rise in death rates of young people on the highways. And it was an extraordinary program. They looked at the design of the car, and they totally reinvented the car with the research they did. I learned to drive with my grandfather on a little red Ford Falcon. That was probably before your time, Rishi. But that was a car that had an all-steel steering column. And there were lots of pictures of people in front-end collisions where the steering column had right through their chest, and they were impaled on a spear. And the steering wheels had sharp centerpieces that would help crush you. They had engine blocks that were solid, and in a front-end collision, the engine block would be an anvil and be forced into the passenger compartment and crush you. The, the car, due to the research that the government paid for, was totally redesigned. So now we have steering columns that collapse, steering wheels that shield you and pad you and protect you. We have engine blocks that crush like an accordion to absorb the impact. We have seatbelts, we have front airbags, knee airbags, head airbags, side impact protection, rollover impact protection. The car is totally redesigned to protect you and save you. We redesigned the roads. We used to think that the best roads were flat and wide and straight. And we learned that if you design a road that looks like an airport runway, people will drive like they're going to take off. And that if you want people to drive at slower speeds to save their lives, you have to build in curves and hills and have it meander and roll and make it narrow, then wide. So we learned to redesign the car, we redesigned the roadways, we redesigned the drivers, and we got rid of drunk drivers, basically, and impaired drivers. And with that, we were able to save probably 600,000 lives since the time this research program started. 600,000 lives is a lot of lives. And it was done by research and by science. So we said, hey, look, let's look at intentional injuries. There's one instrument that takes most lives, just like the car did, and that's the gun. Let's look at gunshot injuries, and let's use science to find ways to prevent these. So we started a research program looking at scientific research to prevent gun violence. And when we started out, we were not a favorite of the NRA. And then the first extramural research study we funded on gun violence found that if you have a gun in your home, we asked the question, does having a gun in your home protect you and make you safe? Because the NRA was saying that if you care about your family, if you want to keep your family safe, you'll have a gun in the home. So we asked the question, is that true? Does having a gun in your home keep your family safe? And what we found was that not only does not does having a gun in your home not keep you safe, but it increases the risk tremendously that someone in your family will be shot and killed 
it goes up threefold. And the risk that someone in your family will kill themselves with a gun with suicide goes up fivefold, fivefold. These are huge increases in risk. And just to put that in perspective, when the FDA approves a new drug, if the risk of side effects with a new drug is 20% greater than the existing drugs, you won't get it approved because a 20% increase in risk is deemed as excessive. Here we're talking about risk not of 20% or 100%, but a 200% increase in risk of homicide or 400% increase in risk of suicide. These are huge increases in risk. And needless to say, the NRA was not happy. So they decided they would put us out of business. And at one congressional hearing, they got in touch with a congressman from rural Arkansas named Jay Dickey. And Jay Dickey was the point person for the NRA, and the NRA wanted to shut down the whole injury prevention center at CDC because they didn't like the gun research, and they got Jay Dickey to lead the charge. And the charge resulted in an ambush at this hearing. It was an awful attack, and I thought Jay Dickey was my mortal enemy. How could he say things that weren't true? How could he want to stop a research effort that could save lives and Jay had been told by the NRA that it's either the research or your guns. And this is what they told the congressmen. This is what they told their members. This is what they told the country, that it's either research or your guns. You have to choose between them. And Jay attacked us, and it was a huge attack. We were protected for a while by the director of CDC, a wonderful man named David Satcher, and he had our back. He knew this was a big problem because he knew that it was a huge problem among those who are most vulnerable. And the job of public health is to protect the vulnerable. And in the United States, the ratio of gun deaths among young black men to young white men is 12 to 15 to 1. And he said, that's our job, is to protect the most vulnerable, especially people who didn't have a voice and for the other leading type of gun deaths, suicides, two-thirds of all gun deaths are suicides, he said those people also don't have clout. They don't have a voice. They're people with mental illness. And this is our job in public health to protect them. And we've got to reduce gun violence because these are the victims. So he had our back. But David Satcher left CDC to become the Surgeon General and the Assistant Secretary for Health a few years later. And someone came to CDC who was not interested in protecting the science. It was a very sad day for CDC, but the scientific research on guns that CDC did after 1999 went down by about 90%. And Congress passed the Dickey Amendment that said none of the funds that go to CDC shall be used to promote or advocate gun control. We weren't doing gun control, but they used it to attack attack us and to attack researchers. And it wasn't until 20 years later, this past year, for the first time ever, that Congress reopened federal research on gun violence prevention. That was a big day. But my day at CDC ended in 1999 when I was fired because I had been advocating this research that was not popular among Republicans or among the NRA. So Jay Dickey and I started out as mortal enemies, but over time, we came to talk. We came to understand each other. We saw that we had children we cared about. Some of our children shared the same problems. We came to trust each other. We came to like each other. I would dare say we came to love each other. And we started working on this problem together. And I saw Jay's point. Jay's point was we've got to tell people that were not about taking their guns away. We wanted to reduce gun violence deaths, but not take the guns away from legitimate gun owners. But he made it clear to me that we needed to state that as one objective, that one objective is to protect the rights of law-abiding gun owners. The second objective is to reduce gun violence, and that we could do both. It wasn't either or but that the only way to do both was to use science because the experiments, when you have two separate objectives to achieve, the experiments are so complex, you can't predict the outcome. You can't do it in your head. 
we needed science to do it. So Jay and I worked together to restart the science, and eventually it took 20 years. But you know, the best time to have done the science was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. <laughs> That's a good, that's a good uh, personal slogan and an amazing story of how you guys actually were able to kind of see each other's side and, and empathize on something that I think uh, America in general is so divided on. And so it's actually, that's why I was hoping you would share that story. It's such a profound one. And when I heard it, I was impressed. It's a story that also has implications for today in the time of coronavirus, because just as Jay and I came to see that it wasn't either you do the research and the science or you protect gun rights. It's not either you do the public health or you restore the economy. You can do them both. You can have two goals at the same time. And it's very much like treating a patient with cancer, that you have to stop the tumor, but you also have to protect the person's vital organs. And I had a friend who had this horrendous sarcoma and for a while, they treated it with chemotherapy, but eventually that started to hurt his heart and his kidneys and his liver, and they had to stop the treatment. So what science needs to do is find a treatment, a therapy for cancer that will both stop the tumor but protect the patient's vital organs. It's You've got to stop the gun violence but protect gun rights. You've got to protect the public health against the coronavirus but you've got to also restore the economy. These are complex problems. All of these problems, all three of these areas, gun violence, cancer, and coronavirus, are too complex to solve in our head. The only way to solve the problems, how do you reopen the economy while saving lives? The only way to find out what works is to collect the data, get the information, do the science. It's so important. The science can get us out of this. It's the only thing that can get us out of it. Are there certain folks that you've seen, uh, political leaders or scientific leaders, that you think we need to be kind of tuning in even more to uh, as we're kind of going through this very troubled time? I think basically we've got to tune in to the science and we need to understand that the science and the public health aspects are not opposed to the economic aspects. You've got to bring both together at the table together. I think for me, I've been extraordinarily fortunate to have two incredible mentors through my life. And I think most people miss out on a mentor. Most people don't really know what a mentor is. And in my mind, a mentor is someone who stays with you and advises you and helps you through life. Life is difficult. Life is hard. You've got to learn to grow up. You've got to learn to stay the course. You've got to get through what Philip Roth co called those inevitable disappointments and those inevitable betrayals in life. You need someone strong to support you. And that's what a mentor can be. So do I know people whose teachings ought to be taken into account? For sure. One of my mentors is Bill Fage, who was the person who asked me to come back to CDC to start looking at violence as a public health problem. But he's also the person whose strategy eradicated smallpox from India and subsequently from the world, and is one very, very wise man. And so he put together some lessons from his experience with smallpox eradication and other issues in public health. And what he said, the first lesson that he learned, and the most important, is to know the truth. And in the case of coronavirus, it means we've got to know where the virus is. This is a ferocious and violent enemy. It's a horrendous battle for life. This is life and death battle, and not only here, but around the world. And we've got to start by knowing the truth. Where is our enemy? Where is the virus? Who has it? How many people? How many people have been tested? Are these rates going up or down? Um, we've got to know that every day. But know the truth is so important. And unfortunately, these days, there's a lot of suppression of the truth. 
And uh, I think it's not suppression by bad people, but it's suppression of the truth by people who think in black and white, you know, that it's either public health or the economy. It's either Republicans or Democrats. It's either, 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 either testing or the economy. These are not dichotomous choices. And I think Bill Feige was willing to say you've got to know the truth, even when the truth is not politically the most attractive or helpful set of numbers. You've got to start there, and everyone has got to know it. And we need a reliable source to put out the truth these days. But he's someone who's been an incredible mentor to me, an incredible teacher to many, many people in public health around the world. Mark, you know, a lot of our audience are students coming up into public health or the health sciences, going to be clinicians one day. And you've touched on a lot of topics here. You talked about empathy. You talked about the importance of having good mentorship, uh, accepting and understanding nuance and subtlety. Uh, what advice would you offer these folks that are coming up during this very uh, divided time and a very scary time where uh, it's uncertain what's going to happen next week, let alone six months or six years from now? I'd say, first, you are important. Who you are not just what you do, but you are important. And I would get a mentor. And I think most people don't really appreciate that and don't go after it. But if I can tell you a story, it starts with my wife, who was a psychotherapist. And she worked at Emory University. She was really good and really smart. And one day she went out to dinner with her colleagues, other therapists. They went to a nearby restaurant and they were sitting and eating when my wife saw two people come in and she said, oh my God, don't let them see me. Don't let them recognize me. The reason was these were her former clients. And she said, you know, it's just so awkward in public when you see your clients. How do you introduce them? Oh, you know, this is John and Laura and they were having mental problems for a while, but I fixed them up. It's so awkward. She just kind of ducked down a little bit and hoped that they wouldn't see her. No luck. They came right over to her, and they came right up to her as she kind of gulped, and they said, excuse me, you may not remember us. Fat chance. <laughs> I mean, she certainly did. They said, you may not remember us, but we remember you because we were having problems. We were having problems. You helped us. And you helped us so much that now, and they showed her her rings, we're married. And we always say, if we ever found you, we would have to come up and say thank you for everything you did for us. And my wife came home from the restaurant, and she told me that story. I was really touched. And I said to her, doesn't that happen a lot? And she said, no, hardly ever. And I said, why do you think that is? And she thought for a minute, and she said, I think it's because people think I'm just in this as a business transaction and that they don't mean anything to me. And I said, is that the truth? She said, absolutely not. Nothing could be further than the truth. She said, you know, you get very involved with the people you see and you care deeply about them. And people just don't get it. They don't understand it. And it struck me, it's the same thing with teachers teachers of medical students or teachers of nurses or teachers of college students, they don't go into this for the money. For them, the rewards are not the business transaction, but the rewards are having students who care about what they're taught and who care about them. And so I would say to people, go get a mentor, go find someone, find a teacher that you care about. It could be a college teacher, a nursing school teacher. It could be a nursing supervisor or a supervisor for doctors. But find someone who's a teacher, go up to them and say, you know what, I really like the way you think. Or what you said last week really stuck with me. It impressed me. It was really important. Do you think we could find a time for coffee? And start the relationship. Be proactive, but get it started because you may be starting a relationship that could last you the rest of your life. Both of my mentors, Bill Feige and another one, Howard Hyatt, 
who's been an extraordinary teacher, who was a former dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. And both of these people started out as mentors, as teachers, and then became friends. And then it, Philip Ross said about one of his mentors, someone named Bob, he said, to cut to the chase, Bob and I fell in love. Not physical love, but just a, an amazingly close friendship that meant the world. I fell in love with these two mentors that I have, and they've become extraordinarily close and valuable friends, and that's available for you. People are hungry to teach as well as to be taught, and they're out there, but start a relationship, find a mentor, develop a mentor, and then become a mentor. I think it's really invaluable to you. It, it will be a source of infinite comfort, support, and wisdom. It's worth doing. Well, that's an amazing uh, note to end on. I mean, I, I uh, can't tell you enough how, how grateful I am for you to send that message out to, uh, to folks listening through this podcast, because I think it's the most powerful one of all, is, is that uh, I think that there's a need for more love in the world, and that mentorship is something that's very overlooked, and, um, and, and just has meant the world to me as well, as I've searched for mentors. And, and uh, I hope it, uh, y you don't think that this is out of place, but I've been reading your book and following your life because I, I regard you as a budding mentor of mine, someone that I'd like to kind of follow the footsteps of as well. I would be honored and delighted, Rishi. Well, on that note, well, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, I'd like to just say thanks again to Dr. Rosenberg for being with us today. I'm Rishi Desai, and thanks for checking out today's show. Remember to do your part to flatten the curve and raise the line. Remember, we're all in this together.